Would you take your Bibles with me, please, and go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Now, if you know anything about Psalm 119, you know this is the longest chapter in all the Bible. There are 176 verses in this chapter. No, we will not be reading all of them. We will not. But we do want to look at one portion of today as we continue this idea of God's good treasures. Would you stand with me as I read aloud from Psalm 119, starting down in verse 97. Please use the Pew Bibles if you don't have a copy of God's Word of your own. Psalm 119 and verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Would you bow and pray with me again, please? Oh, Father, thank you so very much for this privilege to be together again with my brothers and sisters in Christ, with my friends. Thank you, God, that you've got a place for us to come here. And thank you that you've given us the most precious book to share. Would you guide the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and mind now as we begin to think about and look at this great treasure, not only a good treasure, but a great treasure, of the Word of God. Holy Spirit, would you empower it now to touch our hearts, change our minds, open our eyes, and help us to live for your sake and your glory. And we pray this all in Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday, we began a new series of messages, and I want to continue with that today. We're looking today at the good treasures of God God's Word. I gave you a principle last Sunday, and I want to repeat it today. That We'll be referring to that several times as we make our way through this idea of God's good treasures. And that principle goes like this. God opens His good treasures when He draws from His boundless resources to meet our most important needs. If you were with us last Sunday, do you remember that from last Sunday? Do you remember that? You can nod your head, it's okay. You remember that? Okay. The principle is God opens His good treasure when He draws from His boundless resources to meet our most important needs. Now, you all know that we have important needs here, don't you? Right now, we've got people in our church family who are going through a lot of difficulty, a lot of grief. We'll say more to you about that later to focus your prayers on one in particular. I know that there are important needs in this church family. I know that. Believe me, I know it. I talk to people every week. I visit with people every week. I call them on the phone. I go see them. It's part of my responsibility to deal with the important needs that arise in our church family. I can't know all of them, of course, but I know a lot of them. And as I look out across our church family here today, this morning, I realize that there are many important needs There are many heavy burdens on hearts this morning on various ones in our church family. Very heavy, very difficult, very painful. But isn't it good to know this morning that in the midst of our needs that God has boundless and unlimited resources? Isn't that good to know that no matter what you're facing, God has what you need to face it? God has what you need. There are many times... When needs arise that I don't have resources, that ever happened to you? How's it go? At the end of the month, there's too much month at the end of the money or something like that? I don't have the resources to meet those needs. I'm often short on resources. When Brendan will ask me, do you have any money to pay for this? I find that I'm often short on resources. And I guess that's carried over to our only son because too many times I left my wallet at home. I don't have any money with me. It's funny how he does that. 
I'm hoping his mamma will set him straight on that and make sure he doesn't do that anymore. Okay. But God does not lack, he is not short when it comes to resources. God has whatever we need. God has boundless resources, unlimited resources, and God's grace is enough to meet the most important needs of our lives. Do you believe that this morning? God's grace is enough to meet the most important needs of our lives. So that's the principle that we're looking at here. We're repeating as we go through these messages, these sermons as we're operating on this idea of thinking about God opening His good treasure, His good treasure. God opens His good treasure when He draws from His boundless resources to meet our most important needs. And one of the most important needs that we have today is to see the value of things. To see the value of things. It seems to me that many professing Christians don't really see the value of certain things. Have you noticed that? One of the most important needs of our day is to see the value of things. We seem to elevate the value of trivial things, little things, over things that are very important and even most important, don't we? You know about the value of things out here in the material world. You know that. But I'm talking to you this morning about the value of things in the spiritual world, seeing the value of these things that are eternal, things that will last forever, not just things that will last for a while. Now, you know the value of a good suit of clothes. You would not take an expensive suit of clothes and just wad it up and throw it in the corner over there. Folks, you can ask my wife. I treat my suits with tender, loving care. I treat them with an understanding of their value. You don't see me wearing this when I'm out cutting my grass or washing my car. They cost too much to treat them like that. Let's suppose, gentlemen, that you were about to change the oil in your car or your truck, and your wife had in your house this expensive bowl, say a crystal bowl, if you will, or a vase that she bought somewhere. Now, while she's out shopping somewhere, you decide to use that expensive bowl or that vase that your wife bought to drain the oil out of your car or truck or to catch the oil in that bowl. You with me? Okay. Now, you know, gentlemen, that your life on this earth would soon be over, wouldn't it? Your wife would say to you, you don't understand the value of this bowl or this vase. And you must not understand the value of your own life, because if you did, you wouldn't do something like this, you big goof. Okay? Now, you understand the value of things. I can put it to you like this. No one pours gasoline down a storm drain today, do they? Why? Because gas prices are so high, you would never waste it that way. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I go to fill up my car, it sometimes takes my breath away. You know what I'm saying? Okay? We understand the value of a gallon of gasoline. We could go on and on talking about this kind of thing, understanding the value of things. Speaking of that, you know just in a couple weeks we're going to be celebrating Mother's Day. And there's a story from several years ago about a man in New Jersey who wanted to buy his mother a very special Mother's Day gift. His mom lived in Texas, so he found a very expensive Zerka bird. It's actually called a Zerka bird. And he had it delivered to her home in Texas. Now, this bird spoke five different languages. A couple days later, he calls her. He says, Mom, how'd you like the bird? And she says, without even blinking, it was delicious. And he's upset, and he says, Mom, how could you eat that bird? That bird spoke five languages. And she said, well, then why didn't he say something? <laughs> okay. She ate that very expensive bird because she didn't understand the value of that bird. Well, as I've said to you, there are many people in the church today who don't understand the value of spiritual things. Oh, they say they understand. They say, well, I, I know how important that is. But they really don't. They really don't understand. The truth is, if we understand what is truly valuable this morning, we wouldn't be living the way we are. We would be living differently. We wouldn't be interested in temporary, trivial things more than we are interested in spiritual things. We'd be more interested in the spiritual things than in the trivial things of this life. One of the things that always happens when God breaks into a church in times of revival and spiritual awakening, when revival truly comes to God's people is God's people see the value of things. They understand this is worth something. This is valuable. The people of God become astonished 
that they could ever have treated such valuable things so casually. They stop putting trivial things over the important things. They begin to see what is truly valuable. They're shocked that they could ever take the valuable things so casually and so lightly. When true revival comes to the people of God, they see what is truly valuable, and they begin to live accordingly to what is truly valuable. And they are ashamed and embarrassed that they ever took these valuable things so lightly and so casually. One of the things that God does when he opens unto us his good treasures is he helps us to see what is truly important. Now, with all that in mind, I call your attention here today to this 119th Psalm. And I will tell you that when we experience revival as the people of God, and by the way, revival is something that only can be experienced by the people of God. Please understand that because revival means to come back to life here. It assumes that you have had spiritual life at one time. Lost people don't have these things. If you're sitting here lost, you don't have any spiritual life. You're spiritually dead inside. But believers do have this. And yet we can have weakened life. We know that. But revival means the people of God get that life and that spiritual energy and that spiritual vitality and that spiritual interest back. I say to you, that when real, true revival comes to the people of God, we see the true value of things. We see what they're worth. We understand. And we rejoice in those things. They become very, very precious to us. And one of those things that happens to us is, is we begin to rejoice in the precious, precious Word of God. So let me ask you today, how precious to you is the Bible? How precious to you is the Word of God? You hold it in your hands. Maybe you've got it on your phone. I know more and more people are doing that. But how precious is this Word of God? Let me say it to you like this. God is the the ultimate author of Scripture. Standing behind every human writer and author in the Bible is God Himself because God is the ultimate author of Scripture. This is God's Word. Last Sunday we talked about us talking to God and what a privilege that is. This morning we're talking about how God talks to us and what a privilege that is when He gives us His Word. You can look at any portion of the Word of God, any chapter, and you can say, Paul wrote that, or Matthew wrote that, or or Peter wrote that, if it's one of their writings, of course. But you can equally say, God wrote that. God wrote that. Or you can say, as we look here in the book of Psalms, that David wrote this particular psalm, this longest chapter in all the Bible. By the way, most people think David did write the 119th Psalm. Even though his name is not attached to it here, if your Bible is like mine, I've got little subtitles where the number is, and it tells you sometimes who wrote this. You can look at this psalm and you can say, David wrote this, or you can equally say, God wrote this. God wrote this psalm. God is the ultimate author of Scripture. He stands behind every human writer, human author in the Bible. He inspired them to write every word that there is. He supervised their writing as they wrote it down. So what they wrote is his word. So how valuable is the Word of God? I'm going to come back to the question. How valuable is it to you? Think of it like this. God is the author of this 119th Psalm, the longest one in all the Bible. This is the longest song in the book of Psalms. It is the longest chapter in the Bible. And so you have the longest chapter in the Bible being devoted to the Bible. The whole chapter, the whole Psalm 119, is about the Word of God. It's all about that. Okay. So does that not tell you something? How do you think God expects us to respect His Word in light of the fact He devoted the longest chapter in the Bible to the Bible? And it's not just longer by a little bit. It's longer by far than any other. It's much, much longer than any other chapter in all the Bible. Practically every verse in this long, long 119th Psalm is devoted to the Bible, to the Word of God. Some scholars say there's only three verses in all 176 verses in this psalm that have no direct communication to the Word of God. Others say that those verses are connected. They do have a direct connection to the Word of God. But this is how God regards His own Word. He devotes this longest chapter in all of His Bible to the Bible, to the Word of God. So how do you think God expects us to regard His Word? He expects us to take it very, very seriously. That amazes me when I see people sitting while the Bible's being taught or preached and their mind is somewhere else. They're not paying attention. It's like, well, big deal. It's the Bible. Folks, this is the Word of God. This is not just any Word. This is God's Word. Some will say, well, 
It seems to me that God would have devoted the longest chapter in the Bible to the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that the most important thing? But folks, you and I would not know anything about the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ if it were not for the Word of God. Now, would we? That's how we know how Jesus saves us, because the Bible tells me so, right? The Bible tells me so. That's what tells us about the saving work of Jesus. And you could not be sure of the saving work of Jesus if it were not for the fact that this is a sure word, a true word, a reliable word. Folks, I hope you put all your hope in every word God tells us because God does not lie, now does He? Don't you just wish we could have a few less liars today? Just even a few less. That's how you know that the saving work of Jesus Christ is a sure and reliable work. It comes from the sure and reliable word of God. This 119th Psalm is one glorious Psalm. It shows us the treasure that we have in the word of God. For many folks, I'm sorry to say, it's an unopened treasure. They never open this up. They never look at this. They carry it to church. They may glance at it. They may look at it for just a moment or two in Sunday school class. But most of the time, it's an unopened treasure to us. And by the way, There's a humorous story attached to the 119th Psalm. Many years ago, there was a man in uh, in England named George Wishart. George Wishart. He was arrested for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back then, people who did not go along with the state religion were arrested and they were put to death. Wishart was about to be burned at the stake. They were going to kill him by setting him on fire and burning him till he died. But they had this custom back then in those days of allowing anyone who was to be executed to request a psalm, a song, that's what the book of Psalms is, the song book, to be sung. After all, religion was the issue, so Wishart requested the 119th psalm. Now, you know how long it takes to read this. How long do you think it takes to sing this? It takes a while. Now, you can understand why he picked this one, can't you? They're about two-thirds of the way through the 119th Psalm when a pardon arrived from the authorities and Wishart's life was spared. He wasn't burned at the stake. He was glad he selected the 119th Psalm and not the 117th. Go back just two chapters to Psalm 117. Look at that, two verses. Oh, it wouldn't take long to sing that, okay? So his life is spared because he selected this long, long psalm to be sung right before his execution. You talk about a lifesaver. Now, that's a humorous story. I understand that. But the message of this Psalm 119 is very serious indeed. This message is that we have in the Word of God a priceless treasure. This is not something that's casual or or trivial, not at all. One of the things that the St. Clair Southern Baptist Church family needs in these difficult days that we are living in is to have God open to us again and to have God make clear to us again the priceless treasure that we have in the Word of God. Folks, you understand why we have pew Bibles? Because we want people to see the Word of God, to hold it in their own hands if they don't have a Bible. Now, if you don't have one, we can get you one. That's not a problem. But folks, we want people to see this for themselves. Hold this in their own hands. I say to you that God will open His good treasure to us if we will just come to it with a greater appreciation for what we have in the Word of God. If that would happen to us, we could go away saying, God really has opened His good treasure to us in these days. Now, I hope to be used of the Lord today just to open some of the good treasure that we have here in Psalm 119. I want to ask you two questions here as we look at this and try to answer them in the time I've got left here this morning. Here's the first question. Why should we value the Word of God? Why should we value the Word of God? Oh, we hear this, but why should we do this? Yeah, yeah, we hear this. It's important, it's important, it's important. But why should we value this as important? To answer this question, we have to say a couple of things. First of all, we should value the Word of God because of what the Word of God is. Because of what the Word of God is. Would you all agree with me this morning? The Word of God is the Word of Almighty God. This is what He says. This is what He wants us to know. That alone makes it valuable. This is not man speaking. 
This is not a bunch of people getting together and pooling their thoughts and offering their ideas. Folks, the Bible is God speaking to you and to me. He's talking to us right now through his word. It is God's word, as I have already said, and that makes it tremendously valuable. The fact that this is God's word makes your attendance in this service this morning very valuable as well, my friends. It's worth your time to do this. All week long, what have we been doing? We've been hearing what the so-called experts have to say. You've noticed this, haven't you? When they go on the camera and the microphone's on and the lights are on, these are the experts and we're bringing you the truth they say. We've had Ukraine analyzed this week. We've had the economy analyzed this week. We've had this trend and that trend and all this transgender stuff analyzed this week. We've had the 2024 presidential race has been analyzed. Will he run? Will he not? Who will run against him? All those kind of things. We have been analyzed to the point of exhaustion, have we not? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of hearing what they've got to say, aren't you? I'll say what my, my late mother said. I'm sick and tired of hearing it, okay? And now we come to the Word of God. And when we come to the house of God and we open the Word of God, we're not just hearing what man has to say. Oh, not at all. We're hearing what God has to say. This is God talking to us. Isn't this refreshing after having walked through another week of this and that piece of analysis? Isn't it nice to come here to the house of God and to open the word of God and to know that we have in the word of God the word of God? Not what someone says is the word of God. This is the word of God. And it's true and it's sure. One of the fascinating things to me about this particular Psalm 119 is how often the psalmist uses the word your, Y-O-U-R. Here's some homework for you today. I don't give you a lot of homework, so don't complain, but here's your homework today. This afternoon, if you have the time and the opportunity, go home and read through Psalm 119, all 176 verses, and take a highlighter or an ink pen and underline or star or highlight every time you see the word your. It'll always be capitalized when it refers to God. That's what the psalmist is doing here. He's saying to us, God, this is your word. This is your word. This is your word. This is God's word talking to us. That's what makes it so very valuable for us. He uses 10 different terms for the word of God in Psalm 119. Have you ever noticed that? He uses a lot of different words. This shows you something of the value of the word of God. He uses the term word, law, statutes, way. Commandments, path, testimonies, precepts, judgments, and sayings. All these different terms. It's like he's turning the word of God around in all these different directions, looking at all these beautiful parts to it, and he's saying this is what describes just a portion of the word of God. He sees the glory of it all as he looks at the word of God. God's word is God's law. God's word is God's testimony. God's word is God's commandments. God's word is God's way. How valuable are these things anyway? They are very, very valuable. But the psalmist was not content just to use different names for the Word of God. He also uses here several graphic pictures of the Word of God. Go to verse 9 of Psalm 119. Psalm 9. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? Verse 9 tells us the Word of God is like water that is used to cleanse us. The water suggests cleansing. How valuable is water? Well, he says the word of God is like water. Go down to verse 14 of Psalm 119. We're going to be staying here in Psalm 119, so just keep your Bible open there. He says in verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. The same idea is down there in verse 72. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Do you want to know how much you value the Word of God today? If you're asking yourself, do I really put a lot of stock and value and importance on this or not? Here's a simple way to ask and figure out your own value of this. Which would you rather give up? All the money that you have in your bank accounts or your Bible? Which one would you rather give up? That will tell you where you are in your regard for the Word of God. Now, some of you may say, well, I wouldn't have to give up much if you're looking at my bank accounts. wouldn't have to give up too much. 
Well, others, I hear that amen out there, okay. Well, others would say, well, I have to give up a whole lot because I got a whole lot of, in my bank accounts, I got a pretty big bank account. But folks, it doesn't matter if you've got millions and millions of dollars stashed away in some bank somewhere. This man says to you here in Psalm 119 that the Word of God is more valuable than all the money in all the banks in all the world. Look at verse 72 again. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Do you understand what he's saying here? He's saying that this Bible that you hold in your hands, this Bible that you possess, now if you're like me, I've got several Bibles in my office, but he says this is more valuable than all the money you have. Some will say, well, I'm not sure about that. Now, wait a minute, a person's got to have money. Money makes the world go round. Folks, can we just drop that for a moment? God makes the world go round, okay? Not the banks, not the financial systems. But I will tell you that this Bible is more valuable than money because your money can help you with things down here. I understand that, but it can only help you down here. Only down here. This Bible will help safely get you through this life and safely into eternity. It's not just for down here. It's for up there too. It will take us home to heaven. This is an eternal word from an eternal God. Long after all your coins and money have passed away, the word of God will endure because the Bible says, look in Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Now the critics say, oh no it isn't. There's all kinds of questions. We decide what's settled. You've heard this argument, haven't you, about climate change? That's settled science. Have you heard that? White House has been saying that now for quite a while. But last time I studied science, science is always exploring, always questioning, always asking. Things aren't settled. But we're being told it's settled. No, here's what's settled. God's word is settled in heaven. Look at verse 127. Go further down to Psalm 119. Verse 127, he says, Therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. What? The word of God is more valuable than gold? That's what he says. Verse 162, he puts it like this. He says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. There's that word your again, over and over again, your word as great treasure. Now, I know what some people are going to say. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure that God's word is more important than great treasure. If I found some billion dollar uh, find somewhere with coins and gold and jewels, why, that's worth a lot, don't you know? Well, not, not as much as it used to be. I'll put it that way, that's for sure, with inflation like it is. But I will tell you, this Bible is more important than all the money you could ever have. More. He says, another picture here, these are some of the pictures he's talking about the Word of God. He says it's like water. He says it's like treasure. Go back to verse 24 for just a moment. He says another picture of the Word of God. He says, your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. He says they're like companions. Now, folks, you know this. Companions and counselors in life are valuable, are they not? You need people to help you when, you when you're dealing with something you don't know the answer. You go to someone who can give you some help here. He says the Word of God is like that. In verse 54, he says something else. Look at verse 54. He says, your statutes, there's that word your again, your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. He says, God, your word is like a song to me. It's like a song. He says they make his heart sing. In verse 105, here's a classic verse. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's part of what we tell our boys and girls every summer in Bible school. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. So how valuable is the word of God if the psalmist can use pictures like this? The answer is the word of God is very valuable. There's no doubt about it. Why should we value the word of God? Because of what it is, that's one reason. Here's a second reason. We should value the Word of God because of what it does. Not just what it is, but what it does. What does the Word of God do? Go back to verse 1 of Psalm 119. 
He says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Here's part of what the word of God does. And this is the reason that the word of God is so valuable. It says there in verse 1, it brings blessings into your life. That word blessed is translated as happy. I hear people say this all the time, just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Is that asking so much? I just want to be happy. And you know that if you're following the baseball teams these days, there's not a lot of happiness out there, is there? There's not a lot. He says, blessed are you, happy are you, if what? If you walk in the law of the Lord. People who are so concerned about happiness today, uh, this psalmist says, if you want true happiness, you'll find it in the word of Almighty God. That's where you find it. In fact, our happiness is to live in God's Word and for God's Word to live in us. That's where happiness comes from. The Word of God brings blessings, but it also brings something else. Go back to verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? It brings cleansing to us. Look at verse 11. Your Word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's also part of the pledge of the Bible that we have our boys and girls do every summer at Bible school. Folks, it's called Bible school for a reason, because we tell them and teach them the Bible. That's what that's about. So it brings blessing. It brings cleansing. Look at verse 45. He says it brings something else. Verse 45, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. There's that word again, your. Liberty. He says it brings blessing. It brings cleansing. It brings liberty. That means freedom. Now, you know this before I say it. The devil's a great liar, isn't he? I'll try that again. The devil's a great liar, isn't he? He's a great liar. And he would have you to believe that there is liberty in sin. What's he say to young people all the time? Oh, no, no. You don't want to listen to that Word of God stuff. You don't want to listen to a sermon. Oh, no, no. Disregard that. Disrespect that. Don't even go. Tell mom and dad. Tell grandma and grandpa, I'm bored, and I can't sit here any longer. I'm bored. Oh, I'm bored. Ever hear that from your kids? We hear that at camp every summer. I'm bored. But you know what? When the devil says, you've got a lot more freedom if you just don't listen to the Word of God. There's liberty in sin, he says. You'll have so much more freedom if you just do what I say. Don't listen to the Word of God. Listen to me. But folks, what I say a minute ago, he is a liar. He's a liar. There's no liberty in sin. You talk to people who are trapped in sin. What is that? We call it bondage. We call it slavery in sin. But the Word of God brings liberty, verse 45 says, because it breaks down the power of sin. Go back to verse 105. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What does the Word of God do? It also gives us direction in our lives, not just blessing and cleansing and liberty. It gives us direction. People say, well, I just don't know which way to go in life. Here's where you find it. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. That means God's word gives us and provides direction for us. Now, you know, people spend a lot of money today on getting direction in their lives. You know that? They go to psychiatrists and psychologists and psychoanalysts, and they spend a lot of money trying to find direction. There's a guy that just signed a multi-million dollar contract to play football with the New York Jets. Played for years with the Green Bay Packers. He spent three or four days in total darkness looking for direction. Now, does that make sense to anybody in this room? You want to know where you're going? Turn all the lights out. Let's see what happens. That makes no sense at all. But he's a goofy quarterback, okay? People spend money wanting no direction. They, they want to know what to do. They want to know how to live. This man says the Word of God is the lamp that we need. It is the light that we need. We are living in dark and disturbing days, folks. You know this. And many times we don't know which path to choose. But according to 1 Peter, rather 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it tells us the Word of God is like a light that is shining in a dark place. You tell me this isn't dark, what we're having little boys and girls here about changing their gender. That is dark and that is destructive, and you know it. And we need some direction here, and God's Word gives it. So how valuable is the Word of God? It does all these things. Look at verse 130, just a minute. Verse 130, the entrance of your words gives light. 
It gives understanding to the simple, the psalmist says. The Word of God only provides blessing and cleansing and liberty and direction. It also provides understanding. I don't understand God. Well, then go to God's Word. He'll give you some understanding. Now, all these things will become clear to us if God opens to us the good treasure of His Word. When revival and spiritual awakening breaks out among the people of God, the Word of God becomes exceedingly precious to us. The people of God can't get enough of the Word of God. Not how much longer will the sermon last, but no, I want to hear more from God. I want to hear from God's Word because they're hungry for it. Well, I said I had a second question quickly. Here's the question. The first question was, why should we value what is so valuable about the Word of God? Here's the last question. How do we show the value of the Word of God? How do we show that we value the Word of God? This psalm gives us the answers to that question as well. First of all, it tells us that we value the Word of God if we study it carefully. Go back to verse 6. Go back to verse 6 of Psalm 119. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments, the psalmist says. He says we're to look into the Word of God. That's something... That's the same thing as studying the Word of God. Verse 2 says up there in the same Psalm 119, Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with the whole heart, looking for God. Looking for God. This is one way that you show you value the Word of God if you study it carefully. That's why we want you to come to Sunday school, among other reasons. That's why we have midweek services on Wednesdays. That's why we have men's Bible studies and women's Bible studies and Bible school. We want you to know what the Word of God says, and we must study it carefully to know what it says and show that it's important to us. Here's another way you show the value of the Word of God. Do what it says. Obey its commandments. Verse 1 says that. It talks about walking in the law of the Lord. Verse 3 says they walk in His ways. Verse 4 says you have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. This is all dealing with obeying the Word of God. Obeying the commandments of the Word of God shows that we value the Word of God. Here's another way to show that we value the Word of God. Hide the Word of God in our hearts. Go back there to verse 11. Your Word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, He says. The great preacher from England from back in the early 1900s, G. Campbell Morgan, used to say this about verse 11. He said, verse 11 talks about the best book in the best place for the best purpose. He says, verse 11 of Psalm 119 is is talking about the best book in the best place for the best purpose. The best book, of course, is the Bible. The best place is the heart, and the best purpose is so that we will not sin against the Lord. He covered it quite well. If we treasure the Word of God in our hearts, this is how we show that we value the Word of God. If we hide it in our hearts. One last thing, and then we'll pray. We show that we value the Word of God if we rejoice over it and we delight in it. Look at verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Do you delight in the word of God? Do you rejoice in the word of God? Or do you look at preaching and teaching as, oh, it's just something we got to get through. And then we go home and do what we really want to do. I simply want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that we have here in the St. Clair Southern family, an urgent need. We need the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts today, touch our minds today. If you want to get through tough times, folks, we need someone who's tougher and stronger to get us through these tough times, don't we? That's God. It's not us. It's God. We urgently need the reviving touch of God's Holy Spirit because as much as we value the Word of God in this place, we have to say that we do not value it as much as we should. The sad reality is many of us have gotten so familiar with the Word of God, God, and this is especially true for teachers and preachers of the Word of God, that we become dull in our hearing. Oh, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. So what? I've heard that. As if somehow there's nothing for us every time we hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, when we come in here, every time we hear it, we should say, God, show me some more. Show me some more. Show me some more. 
We need for God to open the good treasure of His Word so we'll realize how precious the Word of God is and how blessed we are to have the Word of God. You understand, most people around the world don't have what you're holding in your hands right now. We need God to open the good treasure of His Word so that we will again love it and cherish it as we once did and as we ought to do. So I ask you this morning to join me, my brothers and sisters in Christ, those in this church family, in asking God to open to us the good treasure of His Word. Amen? Amen. Let's bow together. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, that you've reminded us in verse after verse after verse after verse of how precious, how special, how wonderful your holy word is. That This is never just the opinions or the thoughts of other people. These are the very words of God himself spoken to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to every writer of every word, every line, every verse, every chapter, every book. From front to back, start to finish, top to bottom, this is the word of Almighty God. And it speaks to us today whether or not we think so, whether or not we hear it, whether or not we're paying attention. It speaks to us, God. And it is only and always in our best interest to be listening to the word of God, reading the word of God, studying the word of God, hearing the word of God taught or preached so that we know what you want from us, God, that you show us how to live, what to live for, what not to live for, what to chase after, what not to chase after, how to spend our time and not spend our time, how to spend our resources and not spend our resources. All that and so much more. Your word tells us we will be blessed, we will be happy if we follow your word. But how can we know what it is unless we know what it says? Thank you, God, for what it says. Thank you for what it is. Thank you for what it does. It washes us. It cleanses us. It refreshes us. It guides us. It it shows us the right way to walk. It gives delight to our souls. And Lord, if that's not the case for someone here today, would you please now speak to them as we sing to you? If they've lost that love for you and your word, dear God, would you restore it? and bring it back so that they would rejoice in the precious Word of God as they once did. And if they've never had that kind of joy in your Word, even now, God, would you do the saving work that only you can do through your Son, Jesus Christ, to change their mind, change their heart, change their life, change the way they look at things, change the way they think about things, change them so that they will be saved and forgiven as Christians are saved and forgiven. Thank you for that, God. Would you hear our prayer now for all these things to be done for your sake, for your glory, for your honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.